cross over the in front of the inferior vena cava and will uh, 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 sorry uh, will pass in front of the aorta and it will drain into the interior uh, inferior vena cava okay and the innermost part of this this uh, kidney will get the collecting system which includes the calyces then the renal pelvis and the ureter okay so this is the um, relation here you see this is inferior vena cava is in the right side this left to it is the this is abdominal aorta okay and this is right kidney from here the this is hilum in hilum this relation this vein is most anterior then behind this vein is the this is the renal artery and posterior to is the renal pelvis so in the right side this re, renal vein uh, coming out and directly drain into the inferior vena cava but in the left side if this renal vein will go in front of the front of the abdominal aorta this is abdominal aorta and will drain into the inferior vena cava so before draining into the inferior vena cava it will receive superiorly it will receive the uh, supra uh, vein from the coming from the this is suprarenal gland this vein draining the suprarenal gland and draining into the inferior vena cava this is the left gonadal vein and draining into the inferior ven uh, renal vein and lumbar veins some lumbar veins also will drain into the this 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 uh, renal vein okay so these are the relation here next uh, coming to the cross section this medullary area this is the outermost part is the cortex this is cortex renal cortex this is medulla and this is the calyces and pelvis so this medulla uh, can you hear me uh, yes sir okay uh, medullary area are made up of composed of this pyramid uh, pyramidal shape okay so these are the renal pyramid uh, in the renal medulla okay uh, and more centrally located and separate you see this is one pyramid this is another this is another like this is that uh, many pyramids and these are separated from one another by the extension of this cortex this is the extension of the cortex through the in between the pyramids huh? uh, this cortex is extending this segment of cortex are called this segment this segment of the cortex is known as uh, column of the cortex is known as column of bartini so this is important this column of bartini is important why because here the vessels and all these things enter in this suppose this renal artery is entering segmental artery and all this then ultimately this vessel will go to the cortex through this uh, column of bassini and the veins will come out through the columns of bassini so this is the path of the vessels uh, entering or coming out of the uh, cortex okay so this is its, uh, the, the column of uh, bartini so this is very important and here uh, so each again this each renal pyramids each renal pyramids these are the pyramid terminates into papilla this portion this portion is known as papilla so each pyramid will terminate into papilla and this papilla will cup cupped by a binor calyx these are this is calyx this is minor calyx this is another minor calyx this is another minor calyx so this papilla will uh, is cup uh, by a minor calyx this is minor calyx okay entering into the minor calyx so uh, the number of the pyramid so this as the all the pyramid will uh, enter into the minor calyx so the number of pyramids will correspond with the number of the calyces 
clear the calyces mean i want I want to mean the minor calyx okay these are the this is one minor calyx this is another this is another minor calyx so all this this group of minor calyx will join together and will 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 uh, will form a major calyx this is a major calyx this is one major calyx this is another major calyx here another major calyx because all these minor calyces are will join and will, will, will form the major calyx so this is one major calyx this is another major calyx this is another and this major calyces will will combine and ultimately this will form a pelvis of the kidney this is the this area this white area is the pelvis of the kidney renal pelvis and this renal pelvis will come out through the uh, hilum of the kidney okay so next is the vasculature uh, arterial supply and the venous drainage of kidney is a very important and you know each kidney is supplied by the artery which is branch of the aorta and drains uh, into the, the renal vein drains into the renal uh, inferior vena cava okay so this renal vein if you see the pelvis relation of the renal vein in the pelvis as i we already discussed is the anterior most structure in the pelvis of the kidney uh, okay and behind the renal vein you get the artery that means artery in the middle and the pelvis is the posterior most uh, most posteriorly located so this right renal artery passes behind as as already i have mentioned right renal artery passes behind the inferior vena cava left renal vein uh, passing anterior to the aorta okay so and sometimes this right renal vein divides and send one limb anterior and one limb posterior to the aorta okay so this actually normally what happens this left renal vein pass behind uh, pass in front of the left renal vein pass in front of the aorta okay this is normal situation sometimes it divides and and uh, another branch is passing uh, behind the abdominal aorta okay so one branch in front of the aorta another branch behind the aorta okay uh, that means posterior to the aorta and, and and this is this condition is known as renal collar so sometimes you may get, get this of this uh, short of arrangement and uh, during surgery you have to remember all these points next uh, okay so then this renal artery coming each renal artery and they will divides into four or more segmental arteries okay so the first and most important division of the renal artery is the posterior branch posterior segmental artery and then the remaining anterior division branches they will branch into apical ap apical if you see here if you consider this apical then upper middle and lower segmental branch here you can see here okay uh, this renal artery divides into segment these are the segmental artery okay most common and first branch is the posterior segmental artery which will supply this is the posterior surface supply the posterior aspect of the this area of the kidney and the anteriorly you will get different branches which will, which will uh, these are apical branch upper branch middle branch and the lower branch this will supply this this is the anterior surface this area and if you see the lateral convex border this epic this this is the posterior this apical upper middle and lower portion okay so these are the segmental artery and if you follow this segmental artery again here this segmental artery divide into interlobular artery then arcuate artery 
then interlobular artery, and ultimately afferent artery. This afferent artery will go into the cortex, cortex of the medulla, uh, of the kidney, and will enter into the, you know, in the cortex, we will get the, uh, the nephrons are the structural and functional unit of the kidney. And these nephrons are having the glomeruli. And these glomeruli are situated into the cortex of the kidney. And uh, this glomeruli at the cuff of capillaries. And these are ultimately branching coming from the afferent artery. And this is the afferent artery, how it is coming. Okay? From the segmental artery. Entering through the, this interlobular artery, entering through the column of Bartney, what I have already mentioned. Okay? So, venous system, and these segmental arteries are end arteries. These segmental arteries are end arteries. Though we are having different divisions, posterior and anterior epical middle, these segmental artery do not anastomose with the each with each other. So when there is any blockage, so these are the end arteries uh, supplying a particular area segment of the kidney. But on the other hand, this venous drainage is having having uh, free anastomosis throughout the kidney. So, but this artery supply doesn't have this anastomosis. This segmental artery will not anastomose with each other. So, when there is occlusion of this segmental artery, this segmental artery, what will happen? This occlusion will lead to infraction of the parent, renal parenchyma. Suppose this posterior segment or the apical segmental artery, this apical segmental artery is is blocked, okay? Uh, lead will lead to lead to necrosis of this segment, as because there is no anastomosis in between the segmental arteries. Huh? That's why these are known as uh, end end artery, okay? But occlusion, on the other hand, the occlusion of this this segmental vein will will, will not make any problem. Okay, because as because they are having anastomosis, right? So here you can see in this diagram, this is the uh, segmental artery entering into the uh, after and renal artery entering into the kidney. This will divide into different segmental arteries. What I have described, then it will divide into lower lower arteries. Okay, so these are the lower arteries. So laboratory will enter, will proceed further in the in the most central part in the calicial system. This is this is the calis. Okay, this laboratory will divide and will go between this. These are the papilla in between the pyramids. So these are the interlobular interlobular artery. Then they will form an arcade over the pyramid, these are the arcuit artery, then interlobular artery, then the afferent artery, here they will form the uh, tuff of capillaries in, inside the globuloli because this area is the cortex of the kidney. So here it will form the tuff of capillaries, globuloli, and then the efferent artery, then it's efferent artery, ultimately here the bus, the surface. And here you see this segmental artery, will supply a particular segment of the kidney. Particular, suppose apical segmental artery will supply the apical part of the kidney and uh, they are not anastomosed with each other. So any blockage of this segmental artery will lead to necrosis of this part. But on the other hand, venous drainage are having pre-anastomosis. So any problem with the uh, veins will not lead to any, any problem of the drainage of the uh, venous drainage of the kidney, right? Next. So next is the lymphatic drainage. Uh, uh, there are two or more lymph nodes which are mainly located into the hilum, into the hilum of the kidney. This is the first site of the metastasis or renal metastasis, okay? And from the left kidney, this lymphatic trunk will drain into the, from this hilar lymph node, will drain into the para-aortic nodes. 
Okay, and from the right kidney, it will it will drain into obviously uh, near the structure in the right kidney near the structure is the uh, vein. So they they will uh, drain into the vein, which are very very uh, around the around the venous system. That means they drain into paracabal lymph nodes and the entire uh, autocabal lymph nodes. Okay. So this is the lymphatic drainage. Renal innervation, it is having both sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve supply. Sympathetic are coming from the E8 and 11, parasympathetic coming from the Vegas, and these both sympathetic and parasympathetic will enter into the kidney through the anastomosis over the uh, vessels, okay, and these parasympathetic fibers uh, coming from the vagus and will enter into the kidney uh, over the uh, uh, renal artery. Okay, so this primary function of the renal um, autonomic innervation is that was basomotor and sympathetic will uh, induce this vasoconstriction and parasympathetic will, will, will cause the vasodilatation. Though the kidney are having this vasoconstriction and dilatation depends on the sympathetic and parasympathetic activity, but, uh, but uh, despite this innervation, it is important for us to realize that kidney can function well without any, any, any autonomic innervation. Uh, which is uh, which you can easily understand uh, from the functioning capacity of the transplanted kidney, okay, which is not having any any innervation, okay. Next, so this is about the kidney. Next, we shall discuss about the ureter. Ureter is a fibromuscular uh, structure. And urine is, as I have mentioned, this urine, urine will form in the glomerulus and will, uh, different uh, absorption and reabsorption will take place in the tubules. Okay. And then ultimately, through the papilla, they will drain into the minor calyces and then the major calyces and then to the pelvis. And from the pelvis, it will flow through the ureter. Uh, which is a long fibromuscular tube, tube and through this tube it will, uh, it will uh, drain into the bladder from the kidney to the bladder. So this ureter about 24 to 30 centimeter long and uh, during its course it is retroperitoneal uh, just uh, lying, uh, it is having uh, two portion intra-abdominal and the pelvic portion, abdominal part and the pelvis part, okay? And it is having three uh, narrow constriction, one constriction in the ureter pelvic junction, another constriction uh, where it is entering into the pelvis, uh, passing in front of the uh, iliac uh, vessels, uh, and the third one is in the uh, ureter of vesicle junction. Then crossing the pelvic brim and entering into the into the bladder in the trigon, forming an angling at the ureter of vesicle junction uh, is the primary means of providing anti-grade or downgrade movement of the urine. And this is referred as efflux of urine. So that in the, while entering into the bladder, it will obliquely pass through the wall of the bladder. Suppose this is the wall, it will not enter directly like this. Not, it will, it, it will, it will pass obliquely through the wall of the bladder. Okay, so it is forming an angulation here. This 
angulation is important as well as as it will pass obliquely through the wall of the bladder so it will have a, a, a significant length of the lower ureter passing through the wall of the bladder and this wall of the bladder uh, uh, is surround, surrounds this the lowermost part of the ureter okay and this angulation is is providing this anti-grade flow of urine and this anti-grade flow of urine that means uh, anti-grade flow that means urine is coming from the ureter to the bladder and this anti-grade flow is known as efflux of urine so this angling prevent vesicoureteric reflux reflux means efflux you i have explained and reflux is the uh, reverse flow anti-grade flow that means when urine uh, will go from the bladder to the ureter, enter uh, the, this urine will enter into the ureter from the bladder. So this is uh, reflux, and this reflux is known as vesico ureter reflux. And and this angling in normal situation, this angling uh, prevents the uh, vesico ureter reflux. Okay, and which is retrograde flow or what I have mentioned. And thus the, okay. Uh, this angling of junction is the primary means of providing anti-grade and downward movements of the urine. Uh, already mentioned, I have uh, mentioned it. And so what will happen during boiling? That means during maturation, there will be increase that uh, the rise of intravesical pressure and this keeps the angulation ureter vesicle junction closed as i have mentioned it, it this lower end of the ureter will pass through the wall of the bladder obliquely so when this bladder will contract that's, that means musculature will contract so it will it will it will it will close it will close this 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 lower end of the ureter of the or the junction and thus keeps the urine uh, during maturation uh, this uh, the urine which is lying in the upper portion of the uh, ureter will remain there so as this this is this is closed or okay so this uh, but when as soon as this maturation is completed this intra vesicle pressure will release return to its normal and uh, and will allow again the efflux of that means the urine which is was stagnant in the in the ureter proximal ureter during the act of maturation will come down and uh, efflux will resume okay therefore only time that the bladder is completely empty is in the last second of maturation before the efflux of urine resumes okay uh, this is important to remember. Ureters, the lining of the ureters are made up of transitional epithelium, which is known as urethelia. Then, urethelium is outside this urethelium, we will get the lamina propria connective tissue. Then, when it is, remains in color state, this uh, urethelium is the Will, this mucosa will form the longitudinal fold and outside this mucosa that means outer to mucosa will get the covering of the internal uh, inner longitudinal muscle and outer circular muscle and sometimes in the lower portion will get the oblique muscle also. Uh, this adventitial layer contains the excessive plexus of blood uh, Ureteral uh, uh, blood vessels and lymphatics. Uh, this ureter, ureter, ureter receives blood supply. It's it's very vascular, and will receive blood supply from the multiple sources. And the, the, these all these vessels will form an anastomosis in the adventitial layer of the uh, ureter, right? Uh, so from where they, uh, they are getting these blood vessels, this arterial supply, 
In the abdominal part, I have mentioned it is having the abdominal part and the pelvic part. In the abdominal part, these vessels are coming from the renal artery, gonadal artery, aorta, common iliac artery, and in the pelvis, these vessels are coming from the intern branches coming from the internal iliac artery and its branches and from the vesicle arteries, uterine arteries, and uh, sometimes middle rectal and vaginal in female. So this right, again, this right ureter, so while passing down in the abdominal part, so this ureter, are, uh, just in front of the ureter, we'll get some uh, intra, other intra-abdominal uh, structures which are very important. In the right side, right ureter, uh, we come in contact with the terminal part of the ileum, then the cecum, appendix, ascending colon, and then the center. Why this is important? Because while doing the dissection, we sometimes, while doing the dissection of these structures, we may sometimes injure the right ureter here. And in the left side, we get the, the descending column, the sigmoid column, and, and, and its mesentery. So always remember while dissecting this part, uh, these structures, uh, always remember about the ureter. In the pelvis, particularly in female, uh, female, what happens? This pelvis, this blood, we are having in the pelvis, we are having the ureter, uh, uterus and the cervix, and uterus is supplied by the uterine artery. And from the behind, uh, this, this ureter will go downwards and mediately. Okay, and will cross anterior aspect of the, uh, the cervix. Will cross the cervix and then will enter into the, uh, this, this uh, ureter will, will come in very closely. Uh, in close contact with the cervix and then it will enter into the blood and the uterine artery will pass in front of the in front of the uh, lower part of the uh, ureter so while doing the surgery of the uterus suppose uh, hysterectomy abdominal or laparoscopy so be careful about the injuring the uh, uterine artery, uh, one end of the ureter while ligating the uh, uterine artery. So innervation is not so important, uh, having sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, sympathetic coming from the 10 and 12 spinal nerve and parasympathetic coming from the uh, this, this uh, hypogastric uh, autonomic plexus, which are coming from the second and fourth sector spinal segment. But one thing you have to remember this uh, uterus, uh, uh, this uh, ureter is having peristalsis. So there should be some initiating point of the uh, peristalsis. So this peristalsis says initiates in the in the minor calyx in the inside the inside the kidney and these these minor calyces of this renal collecting system uh, the, the muscles these are known as pacemaker okay these are known as pacemaker of the this minor muscles of the minor calyces is known as pacemaker of the uh, pacemaker for the peristalsis or the contraction of the uh, ureteri muscles, right? Then is the function, uh, function of the kidney, we know this, uh, it's maintained, uh, it acts with water and electrolyte, uh, not electrolyte and other waste products and thus maintain, maintain the water and electrolyte balance, uh, excreting the, all the waste product of the body and reabsorb some important solutes in the collective tubules. So, and then they also influence, maintain the blood pressure, uh, having a key role in the 
acid base, base balance okay and uh, this kidney also function as uh, endocrine organ uh, as it is the site of renin production and vitamin uh, vitamin d synthesis the erythropoietin which is very important is produced in the renal cortex so so which are very very important in the in the regulation of the blood okay uh, rbcs so when a patient will have a problem in the renal cortex uh, there may be problem with the erythropoietin production and ultimately patient will have some sort of anemia so renal medulla medullary interstitial cells also produce some platelet activating factors and proximal tubules proximal tubules is the site for the conversion uh, conversion of calcidiol to calcisatriol these are the functions in short and next is this is about the anatomy and physiology uh, of the kidney and ureter then we will we'll enter into the disease process but before going to the disease of uh, particular disease of the kidney and the ureter we have to know the what are the so how to evaluate the patients uh, suffering from the uh, uh, from the diseases of the urinary system so there are some to uh, like any other system here uh, we have to go through the complete history of the patient a complete physical examination and and the investigations but remember in 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 renal or uh, the urinary system uh, physical examination and in investigation physical examination not physical examination history proper history and the investigations are very very important to diagnose most of the diseases except some some diseases where the physical findings physical examinations are very very important like the way to to determine the renal mass uh, extend distended bladder or the bladder mass to detect the prostatic cancer uh, this physical examinations are also very important uh, okay so to start with this uh, evaluation of the patient we have to go through the proper history and uh, examination and investigation so this what is the time now okay so as the next teacher is not there uh, so can i continue hello sir please can you hear me yes sir yes sir can i continue yes sir okay so thank you so next is the um, most common thing of the urinary system is the pain uh, common symptoms and uh, this uh, pain is because of this urinary pain because of this uh, either because of the obstruction of the tract urinary tract or some inflammation somewhere okay so this pain may originate from the kidney it may originate from maybe because of some pathology in the uh, ureter it may be from the from the uh, bladder it may be from the testes uh, okay or it may be in the perineum depending upon uh, the pathology uh, pathology site of pathology so when this pain originates from the uh, kidney itself uh, this pain is known as renal pain previously it was known as renal colic but this is misnomer because by this time you definitely know colicky pain will take place will originate from a tubular structure okay so kidney is a solid organ so any pathology leading to this will leading will not lead to the colicky type of or spasmodic pain rather uh, it will have a, a constant dragging pain okay uh, because of the distension of the capsule following any pathology okay and it will be it will be constant one right and this pain usually will get 
will get in the in the lower or the renal angle. What is the renal angle? Mm. Uh, by this time, you should know this renal angle. This is the posterior aspect of the body surface. Vertebral column. These are the vertebra, twelve thoracic vertebra, and this is the twelve rib, and this is the site of the erector spinae. Okay. This is the lateral border of the erector spinae, and it is forming lateral border of the erector spinae, forming an angulation with the inferior border of the twelfth rib. So this angle is known as renal angle, and this is correspond with the anteriorly here this point. Okay, so we'll have pain here in the loin in the renal renal pain in the loin here here. Okay, and uh, and uh, the pain particularly in the in the uh, renal angle. Okay. And patient will typically will keep uh, keep his hand over the renal angle like this, like this he will keep his hand like this. So a patient is coming like this, entering in your chamber like this. You can just while he is entering, you make a diagnosis. You might you can think uh, that probably your patient is having some renal pathology or renal pain, right? Next is the ureteric pain. It's colicky pain, spasmodic pain, which is felt in the loin, and then it radiates. This ureteric pain. What is very important in the HTA patient will, will mention that uh, again it will depend upon the site of obstruction. Uh, okay, so it may start in the loin or in the in the course of the ureter, what we have discussed, and it will. It will radiate to the ipsilateral side in the iliac fossa or into the genital. Okay, so this ureteric pain is colicky and very severe. And what you will see, patient will there will be tossing of patient over the back. This is very very important. You should remember this patient. There will be tossing, but. Though the pain is very severe, in the in the if you compare this uh, pain in the pain in case of uh, peritonitis, pain will be very severe. But patient the patient will remain still, will will be very much reluctant to move on the bed. Okay, but in the ureteric pain, ureteric colic, uh, patient will move uh, vigorously, tossing over the bed. So remember this, okay? And this pain will radiates downwards and uh, to the right uh, iliac fossa, right or left, depending upon the side, then the external genitalia or even into the medial aspect of the uh, thigh. And this is probably mostly because of the uh, obstruction in the uh, obstruction in the lumen of the ureter. This obstruction may be because of the stone, because of the blood clot, or the sloughed out renal pepida. Okay, uh, I can show you this uh, diagram here. Here you see this pain may start in the loin. Of course, site of origin will depend upon the site of obstruction, and it will go down, radiate down so into the right iliac fossa. Okay, inguinal region and then to the external genital. Okay. Uh, this pain, uh, this pain may originate from the lower urinary tract, uh, like uh, from the from the bladder itself. The, so there will be some sort of discomfort. Pattern also may complain of discomfort in the supra pubic area and uh, it may be because of cystitis and when there is cystitis typically patient will have burning sensation or burning urethra or burning sensation during maturation right these things we have already discussed and some patient will also complain of pain into the testes or the scrotum uh, so Obviously, uh, there are some 
question will be made. Uh, so they will have, might have the testicular torsion, if it is, it is then infected hydrocele, vericocele, or there may be history of vasectomy, right? Some patient may com complain of pain in the perineum, and of course this patient, mostly the male patient, who are suffering from acute or chronic prostatitis, uh, they, they may complain of pain in the perineum. Okay, and sometimes uh, there may be history of pelvic malignancy. Next complaint is the hematuria, which is very, very important. And uh, hematuria means uh, the blood, passage of blood uh, in urine, and it is always abnormal. Okay, uh, and this may be the only indication of pathology uh, lying in the urinary tract. Okay, this may be the only symptoms, and there may not be any sign, any other sign. Okay, uh, so this hematuria nowadays is classified into two categories one is visible hematuria, another is non visible hematuria. Previously, it was known as uh, macroscopic hematuria and microscopic hematuria, but nowadays these terms are not being used. Now it is, uh, it is, it is known as visible hematuria and non-visible Okay, so you have to get this history of hematuria, uh, timing of hematuria, particularly in relation to relation to urinary stream, whether it is the it is initial hematuria, which may be initial hematuria in the uh, urethra, uh, it, the hematuria may be throughout the stream, the pathology may be in the uh, in the bladder or upper tract, or there may be terminal hematuria where the pathology may be in the bladder neck or the prostate. So the timing of hematuria in relation to the urinary stream is very important to know the site of pathology. This, there are some causes of hematuria. This may be in a trauma, infection, and neoplasm at neoplasm at any level of the urinary tract. But remember, in young women, the hematuria is the uh, commonest finding, commonest finding of urinary tract infection. Okay? That means hematuria is the commonest cause of urinary tract infection in young female. So this when a patient of hematuria will come, you have to investigate it thoroughly. What are the investigations you have to do? This is, of course, you will go for the thorough clinical examination to find out any mass or any other pathology, prostate is enlarged or not, any tenderness, okay? And then you have to, you may not get any, any, any finding in your clinical examination, but you have to investigate to know the cause, you know the cause of hematuria. Uh, you have to go for the midstream specimen examination for midstream specimen you have to collect. Uh, you have to send it for culture and uh, sensitivity test uh, and for cytological examination of the midstream urine. You have to go for the intravenous urogram, urinary tract ultrasonography, uh, than uh, flexible or rigid cystoscopy. We shall discuss a little bit about the USG and cystoscopy later on. And then another very, very important symptom, symptomology is the lower urinary tract symptoms. Lower urinary tract symptoms, uh, in short, it is known as LUTS, L-U-T-S. What are the symptoms you'll get in LUTs? These are frequency, nocturia, strangury, urgency, uh, urine, uh, uh, urge incontinence, stress incontinence, nocturnal aneurysis, hesitancy, reduced urinary stream, and intermittency. So you have to know one by one what are they because uh, uh, what is frequency? This is the uh, number of act of micturition. And usually it means increased frequency of micturition. That change in the 
frequency of act of nocturation. Okay. Then nocturia, what does it mean? Nocturia means the passage of uh, unnoticed or involuntary passage of urine while sleeping in the bed. Okay. Strangery, as when a patient is having a sensation of constantly needing to bite. If she, uh, he will have a sensation, constant sensation that he, he needs uh, biting, though he has passed some urine just now. Okay, urgency, what is urgency? Urgency is, is a sudden compelling desire of the, uh, of the person or the patient to pass urine, which is difficult to defer. It is the, it is the sudden and uh, compelling desire. Okay, and he, he cannot delay the act of lecturation. It's very difficult to defer the act of lecturation. This is urgency. You have to rush, you have to run to the toilet to pass it. So this is urgency. And urge incontinence, urge incontinence is the involuntary urinary leakage of a large amount, large volume, immediately preceded by the by the sense of urgency. Patient will have a sense of urgency, but if he cannot go to the toilet or the, the social environment doesn't uh, allow, uh, this patient will involuntarily will pass a large amount of urine, which this is known as urge. When this patient will have urge, he have to pass, he will have the urgency, and if he cannot pass, there will be involuntary without his knowing yet, uh, the patient will pass a large volume of urine, involuntary. This is hard incontinence. Next is the stress incontinence. Stress incontinence means when there will be some sort of stress, that this is also involuntary, involuntary act, and this uh, large volume of the urine will, will pass out through the urethra uh, following intra-abdominal uh, rise of pressure. This is also involuntary uh, act of passage of uh, urine. Uh, when there will be rise of intra-abdominal pressure, like uh, sneezing, coughing, uh, these are the situation where this patient will, will also pass involuntary some amount of urine. This is known as stress. That means when there is stress leading to in the rise of intra-abdominal pressure, this patient will pass urine. So this is known as uh, stress incontinence. Next. Uh, what is nocturnal, nocturnal analysis? Nocturnal analysis. Uh, nocturnal analysis is involuntary loss of urine, the, uh, urine during sleep. What is previously what we have mentioned nocturia is that means patient had to get up from the bed to pass urine. Usually a normal uh, person uh, do not pass urine the, during his sleep hours. But in nocturia, because of some pathology in the bladder or outlet, this patient have to get up from the bed uh, once or twice to pass urine. This is nocturia. And, and, and what is nocturnal analysis is that this is the involuntary loss of urine during sleep. Patient uh, cannot say, uh, without his knowledge, he will pass some amount of urine in the bed uh, while sleeping. And this is the common um, common cause, uh, commonest cause of this nocturnal analysis is chronic retention with, with outflow incontinence. Chronic retention with outflow incontinence. Is it clear? This is nocturnal analysis. Ha next is hesitancy. Hesitancy means is the difficulty in initiating the micturation. What happens normally, one person go to the toilet and initiate the act of micturition without much difficulty. Okay, but here there will be some difficulty to start or to initiate the act of micturition and resulting in delay 
of the onset of viral. Okay, the patient have to wait uh, for some time. He will stand or he will change his position to, uh, to start the act of micturition. Okay, then is the reduced urinary stream. Uh, nothing to explain. Then intermittency. Intermittency is uh, when the, the urine flow stops and starts one or more time, more of patient during micturition. Right? That means patient, patient started the act of micturition, then automatically this flow of urine stops and then again starts. It, there, it may be once in a single act of micturition or there may be more than one uh, of this sort of stoppage and starting uh, of the micturition. This is intermittency, okay? So these symptoms, again, straining, is the muscular effort, extra strain. Sometimes patient have to exert some extra strain to initiate the act of maturation or to improve or to maintain the urinary strain. Then incomplete emptying is the sensation that, the, that uh, at the end of maturation, patient will have the sense that this bladder is still full. Post maturation dribbling is the involuntary loss of urine that, that uh, urine immediately after the finishing of uh, passing urine. That means patient has finished the act of maturation and after that uh, there will be involuntary loss of urine in his uh, undergarments. Okay, so this is post maturation dribbling. So this, all these symptoms of lower urinary tract are classified as storage, voiding, uh, storage, voiding or post maturation. These, these may be because of the storage difficulty, then maybe because of voiding problem or post maturation. So storage lots, what are the symptoms related to pathology in the storage. That means problem in the bladder. Storage, in the bladder is the storage, uh, store, storehouse of the uh, urine. So there may be storage problem in the bladder because of some pathology. So what all will be the symptoms? There will be increased frequency, increased frequency, nocturia, urgency, and arch incontinence. And these storage lots are typically we'll see in overactive bladder. In what will happen when bladder is overactive? So after a, a accumulation of uh, little amount of urine, this bladder wall will be irritated and patient will have the uh, sensation of passing urine. So he will have the uh, arch of passing urine so, uh, in frequent interval. So the, the, there will be increased frequency and like this in the night time he will have, the, you have to get up and pass urine. He will have the urgency and incontinence in the storage lots. There may be voiding lots. These voiding lots are hesitancy, a reduced strain and strain. Voiding lots are typical we will get in bladder outlet obstruction. Some patient may have storage for both storage and voiding lights in combination. Post lights. Hello. Any problem? Hello. Okay. Uh, we want to have to this on and his sound is coming. Okay. Uh, post maturation uh, maturation lights are completely incomplete are com incomplete empty and post maturation dribbling commonly seen in bladder outlet obstruction. So when you are getting a patients of last, uh, 
uh, lots, uh, either of storage or wiring, or in combination, we have to investigate this patient, particularly we have to go for the urodynamics. Okay, so what is urodynamics? We shall discuss later on little bit. Next. So, if we, uh, after getting all this history and we will go for the clinical examination, okay, then we have to go for the, go for the investigation. Remember, with the exception of renal and scrotal ma muscles, and a palpable bladder or an abnormal prostate on digital rectal examination, urological conditions are most likely to be diagnosed from the, already I have mentioned, from the history and or investigations. So what are the common investigations? Just I, I shall give you the outline. I am not going in details of these investigations. We shall discuss in particular diseases. Okay. So we will go for the urine examination, thorough urine examination, uh, macroscopic and microscopic, culture and cytological, everything. Uh, okay, we shall uh, test for albumin, protein, ketone bodies, everything. Depending upon the finding, we will go for the further examination. And remember, uh, uh, when you will get uh, 10 to the power 5, more than 10 to the power 5 organism per ml of urine, uh, that means uh, that your patient is, is suffering from urine examination. Okay, and then we have to go for the, if required, depending upon the, for the uh, urinary cytological examination of sedimented urine. Next is the renal function test. You remember this more than 70% kidney function must be lost before renal failure, failure comes evident. More than 70% function of the kidney should be lost before the renal failure occurs. So the kidney is are having a good functional result. Okay, renal damage must be extensive before changes occurs in the blood constituents, which level is controlled by the renal excretion. So this, when there will be change in the level of this blood constituents, like urea, creatinine, all these things, there should be, there definitely there will be a, a extensive extensive renal damage as you know even a single kidney can maintain all these levels in normal huh? and this can excrete the normal waste product can maintain the acid balance can a single kidney can maintain a water balance all these things okay so when there is change uh, increase in the level of the urea, creatinine, and other constituents. That means there is extensive damage of the kidney. This damage may be because of reduction in the renal plasma flow. There may be arterial uh, constriction, aneurysm, or any sort of obstruction, and uh, common example is the hypertension. There may be destruction in the. There may be destruction of the glomeruli. Okay, and you know in the glomeruli you will have you will have the um, destruction of the glomeruli. Uh, that means these glomeruli are situated in the cortex. You know very well by this time. And so, when there will be destruction, damage of this, or the necrosis of the cortex, this glomeruli are in the cortex of the, uh, located into the cortex of the kidney. So when there will be necrosis of the cortex of the kidney, uh, this, uh, this uh, the definitely glomeruli will be affected. 
So in the in the acute uh, cortical necrosis or glomerular appendicitis, there will be uh, much changes in the functional aspect of the uh, of the kidney. So this damage may be because of the tubular uh, function, and these tubules are located in the pyramid and uh, med med medulla and uh, so when there is pyelonephritis so there may be tubular impairment functional impairment okay so this elevated blood urea and serum creatinine levels usually is a good in, uh, usually indicates a significant impairment of the renal function as already i have mentioned okay Next is the imaging of the kidney and the ureter. Commonest imaging is the plain x-ray or the straight abdominal x-ray in which includes the uh, kidney, ureter and the bladder. Uh, that's why sometimes it is also known as x-ray KUV and by this time you know the location, vertical level. Okay? Uh, from the T12 uh, we have to Upper limit should include the uh, T12 level. Uh, so any abnormal uh, finding in the KUV X-ray, you should you should note it down. And in normal sitting, we can in normal KUV we will we'll get what we'll get. Uh, will get a short tissue outline, a short tissue shadow of the kidney in the in the area which we have mentioned in the paravertebral gutter. In the paravertebral vertebral easily easily we can see, and in the paravertebral region, in which location in the upper limit in the T12 to L L L3 level in the paravertebral region, we can see the uh, short tissue shadow of the kidney and if uh, uh, there is any any radiopic uh, substance like any, any stone, this will be visible. Okay. So, commonest. What are the indications of QV? Commonest indication to screen the patient for presence of urinary tract calculi, and most of the urinary calculi are radio dense, which you can easily see, except the urinary. Uh, uh, uric acid stone okay and it is also used for subsequent follow up of the patient of the uh, ureteric or kidney stone there may be very small stone you you, you are treated, treating conservatively and uh, these stones are supposed to pass naturally so to follow up this patient you can uh, use this uh, kv kv is also used to check the correct positioning of the ureter extent in some surgical procedure or after surgical procedure or to drain the kidney uh, we, we, you sometimes we use uh, stem which is being passed from the bladder uh, to the pelvis of the kidney or from the pelvis to the uh, urinary bladder so from one side we have to blindly we are pushing so we have to know the position of the uh, other than to know this, we have to go for the uh, KUB X ray to know the position of the video extent. And it is also being used, uh, used in, in, in ESWL procedure, it is a therapeutic procedure we will discuss later on. Next investigation is IVU. Previously, it was known as IBP. IBP, I, IBP intravenous pyelography which is not being used, it's normal. And, uh, right now, it is, it is known as IVU intravenous urography. And it is particularly valuable to demonstrate the tumors and calculi within the urinary tract. Okay? Uh, where we have to inject dye after uh, sensitivity test, Okay, uh, a dye you have to radioactive dye you have to use in this procedure. You have to take the consent from the patient, and after injecting the dye, if sensitivity test is negative, then we will go for the uh, 
uh, go for the serial X-ray. Uh, okay. Then, uh, if the sensitivity test doesn't permit, because this dye, radiopaque dye, is very uh, sensitive, sometimes uh, there may be dangerous hypersensitivity reaction. So that's why nowadays it is it is not regularly used. IBP is not uh, done regularly. Okay, uh, and it is being replaced by NCCT. Uh, in diagnosing this urinary tract uh, tract stones so ibp we can discuss later on in details there may be different types of ibp uh, conventional that then there may be cystography uh, maturity urethrography uh, okay there may be the descending electrophy uh, uh, urethrography Okay, in different situation, you can go for that. Next is the USG of POV or the whole abdomen is high resolution. USG is the perhaps the imaging technique most widely used in urology setup. USG, this USG will give the information about the about the size of the kidney, about the numbers of kidney. There may be absence, congenital absence. There may be fusion, congenitally fused kidney. There, there, there may be uh, abnormal location of the kidney. So this kidney, uh, USG will tell you everything about the size and location and fusion. And uh, it will also it will mention about the thickness of the kidney. There may be the thickness of the cortex. There may be thinning. That means cortex. <coughs> When there is thinning of the cortex, that means this glomeruli is being destroyed. So, uh, functional impairment will be there. The, whether there is any any hydronephrotic change in the kidney, uh, there is any mass in the kidney or into the bladder, or uh, what is the uh, residual volume in the bladder, uh, everything we can assess by USG. Uh, and it is also a regular, is very common investigation in a case of uh, hematuria. Uh, in a case of hematuria patient, you have to work for that USG. And another type of USG you are, uh, we regularly do in, in urological setup is the transrectal USG. Uh, transrectal USG is being done in suspected cases of CA prostate. Then computerized tomography, mainly non-contrast CD, is, is nowadays is the investigation of chairs, as I have mentioned already, IVUs, IVU is not being regularly used because of this uh, dangerous hypersensitivity reaction. So NCCT is, is the investigation of chairs of patient who with, with suspected urinary calculi. Remember this, okay? And if, then we can, in some cases, we can go for the contrastivity to in malignant cases to stage the uh, stage the uh, malignant mass uh, like renal tumor or the muscle involvement in bladder cancer, testicular cancer, and prostatic cancer. Next. Then we can go for the MRI. It is used to stage many urological cancers, and this main ability of MRI is to generate multiplanar images, and this will help. And this will help to plan the. A mode of treatment. Okay, uh, and we can go for the SPECT CT, PET CT, uh, which will provide the meta, provide the metabolic and functional information. Uh, and PET CT looks promising uh, as a tool for the dis detection of distal metastasis in bladder cancer. Then bone scan, 
most frequently used uh, in, in, in uh, not routinely used but in urological malignancy when the other investigations will suggest that uh, uh, probably there are some bony metastasis so in that case we have to go for the bone scan also it is also being used in staging of patient with high risk prostate cancer then this is all about the radiological investigation then we have to another investigation we have to go for the uh, for the uh, to know the functional uh, status of the urinary bladder uh, this is a simple test uh, we have to know the flow rate and uh, usg for to estimate the the residual urine and usually if you get a peak flow rate more than 15 ml per second uh, which suggests there is no significant bladder outlet obstruction but this peak flow rate if it is less than 10 ml per second it, it is strongly suggestive of bladder outlet obstruction urodynamics evolution provides information about the bladder pressure and urine flow the test is commonly performed to investigate investigate male patient who are presenting with lats and female patient with lats or or, or incontinence also it is this urodynamics also used commonly used in patient with suspected bladder neuropathy there are two type two phases of testing one is filling phase another is voiding phase uh, there may be involuntary rises in the intravesical pressure during filling phase uh, with or without a desire to void are classical of overactive overactive bladder so involuntary rises in the intravesical pressure during filling phase with or without a desire to void are classical of an overactive bladder high intravesical pressure during voiding with a residual flow rate is typically seen in man with both uh, next and last investigation is endoscopy here in urology mostly we use cystoscope or ureteroscope in this cystoscope may be flexible or rigid in flexible while doing flexible uh, cystoscopy we can uh, do it under local anesthesia but when going for the rigid cystoscopy preferably we do, uh, we'll do it under general anesthesia and rigid cystoscopy is mostly used uh, in therapeutic purpose but in flexible cystoscopy we can use in in diagnostic purpose and to um, cystoscope are mainly used to visualize the urethra internal aspect of the urethra uh, any problem in the urethra then the uh, then the interior of the urinary bladder but ureteros with the help of ureteroscope which we enter uh, introduce for the internal ureteric orifice from the bladder itself and then if we go further up we can visualize the ureter and pelvis of that side okay so any pathology can be detected there with the ureteroscope in the ureter and the pelvis with this i would like to conclude today so if any question anything you can send me in whatsapp your